and the main cells involved. And remember that uh, one of the best ways to understand, to build the framework of understanding the immune system is to think about it in terms of if the pathogenic invasion is viruses. And viruses, again, are not living, but they are chemicals that can hijack your cells to become virus-making factories. And so your immune system has two wings, like two wings of a bird, the cell-mediated wing and the antibody-mediated wing. And this is going to take out, we're going to see later when we talk about antibiotics today, but that's going to take out free-floating viruses and the cell-mediated wing takes out the factories, your cells that have become virus-making factories. <clears throat> we talked about B cells and T cells. There are three types of T lymphocytes, two types of B lymphocytes. And then we just started to get into the details. Uh, we ended last time going over that table. That is basically your uh, essay number five on your essay handouts and uh, showed where those cells are involved. Basically, T cells are cell-mediated wing, cell -mediated wing and B cells are antibody-mediated wing, but the one cell that is in both is the helper T cell, helper T cells in both wings. That table shows cell and how the actual killing cells kills, okay? And so we're ready to go on and finish up this topic here going on now types of immunity. This is a really good uh, thing to know. What I would write next to this slide, so this is just slide number two, is it's based on what your B cells are doing. This table is organized on what your B cells are doing. That is actually setting up the rows. The columns are whether or not there's medical intention or not. Okay, so if your B cells are actively making antibodies, that would be active immunity. If your B cells are doing nothing, that would be passive immunity. Now in the columns again is whether it's medical intention or not. If you get the flu shot, that is artificial immunity. It is by medical intention. If you get the flu, and survive it and recover, you will now have natural immunity toward that flu bug. So again, the distinctions, it is what your B cells are doing. Let's just make sure you understand that. Active immunity, your own B cells are actively secreting antibodies. In passive immunity, your B cells are doing nothing. You are getting antibodies from another source. And we've actually mentioned that. Now, circulating antibodies only are effective once you get uh, effective titer or concentration. Only for about a week to 10 days. That, that's all antibodies are good for. But if your own B cells are making the antibodies, you have memory B cells in reserve. This immunity is long term. Maybe lifelong, not necessarily. Uh, if it's not lifelong, um, what do you think you need to get to recover it? That is when you get booster shots. So it is long term. Some may be lifelong. Others, you may need to have a booster shot to keep it lifelong. All right. So now let's talk about it in terms of the natural uh, condition without any medical intervention. Active, you get the actual pathogen, you recover, you are now have immunity to it. That would be active natural immunity. Pay attention because this is like a lecture exam three question. Um, when we're teaching Introductory courses, and I've said this many times, 
I'm having to oversimplify it because people, students already bitch about how hard I am. So I have to oversimplify things to the point of it actually not even being true anymore. And part of it is graphs like this on slide two. It makes things sound very neat and clean and the nice little categories. And that's just not true. Um, immunity is shades of gray and you're seeing that now in some of the discussions about the coronavirus. Those that have contacted it and survived it, yes, they are immune to it. Coronavirus, it's still undecided yet whether this thing is a seasonal bug like the flu. And just like with the flu, you might be immune to this winter's flu bug. You're not going to be immune to next winter's flu bug. That might be the case with coronavirus. We don't know yet. Um, but um, also, there are people that have, well, well, we'll get to antibodies later, but the people that have gotten contacted with it and had either very mild symptoms or no symptoms, and the question is, is whether or not they're fully immune or not. Their shade of gray, because their condition was very mild, may not offer lifelong immunity, especially if this this bug mutates a little bit. All shades of growth. Okay, also in that active natural box is chemicals, not just pathogens, but chemicals. Toxins that uh, you are repeatedly exposed to, you can actually develop um, immunity towards. It's like uh, that line from uh, Princess Bride, where uh, Wesley spent many years developing an immunity to iocane powder. That's an actual thing. And there are some people say who are immune to rattlesnake um, crotoxin, rattlesnake venom. They've been bitten so many times and they have survived it. And now they actually have the antibodies anti-crotoxin, okay? That would be natural active immunity. A case of uh, natural passive immunity is uh, remember we talked about uh, in that uh, essay number five, if you look at that uh, on the antibody mediated column where the actual killing cells, the plasma cells secreting antibodies and it mentions IgA secreted in exocrine fluids. So um, nursing mothers will actually secrete IgA in their breast milk while the baby is getting the IgA, but the baby's B cells are not making the IgA. So the baby is getting passive natural immunity. This is why it's important that uh, mother and child are really in close contact with because they basically have the same bugs about them. And especially for IgA, going to uh, external exocrine secretions, uh, it's basically the bugs that are on the outside. Well, the, the baby doesn't have good immunity to those bugs yet. And so, uh, especially when they're still really newborn, and the baby can uh, get benefits from natural passive immunity from breast milk. The key here is that it's the baby that it's passive. He's not, he or she is not making the antibodies. All right, now the artificial column again is by medical intention. So up there in the active row, that would be like the flu shot. That would be like what the planet is trying to get for the coronavirus right now. And they also make uh, toxoids, which are alter, slightly altered chemical toxins that are close enough to the really bad poison that if you're immune to one, you could be immune to the other. It's cross immunity. That's how a lot of flu bugs work, by the way. They, in some years, they will are anticipating a flu bug that's gonna come out for which there is a closely related uh, cousin virus that if you're immune to that um, weak virus that maybe you got a runny nose for three days, but no fever. They'll actually give you that, and that'll make you immune to the real bad bug that can make you sick for 10 days. So that there is shades of gray and cross immunity as well. 
Uh, in the artificial passive, we actually talked about this. And I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to see if you can tell me an example we have talk talked about of antibodies from another source like gamma globulins, monoclonal antibodies, or any toxin that any of We gave a specific example of this. And the hint is in the first syllable of gamma globulin. Nobody? All right, if you have your uh, essays, lecture exam three essays, we just covered number five. Turn one back to number four. Fully explain the prevention of erythroblastosis vitalis. Now some of these words better start making sense. Second bullet, given in a meter dose, first semester, six months right at childbirth, row gap. GAM comes from gamma globulins. Is anti-D made from another source? There it is right there in the distinction column. Providing passive artificial immunity. It's that box. Everybody see that? Okay. And that is prevent an RH negative woman from having a primary immune response. The woman's immune system never makes the anti-D. So Rogam is an example of passive artificial immunity. Ken, that artificial column is uh, by medical intention. In the case of antitoxin antivenom, so say some of those people that have been bit by a rattlesnake so many times and survived it, now they're immune to it. They have antitoxin in their bloodstream all the time. It's part of their uh, globulin plasma proteins. Well, they actually are money makers. They go donate their serum continually as soon as they can, and they get paid a lot of money because they are a source of antiprotoxins. So if you get bit by a rattlesnake and you're fortunate enough to be close to transportation that can get you to an emergency room, what do they give you? They give you antiprotoxin from somebody else who is immune to it and it will help take care of the, the toxins while your body is recovering. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, some more details. Now we're gonna get into antibodies. This is where we're gonna talk about antibody structure. This uh, on slide three is a typical antibody monomer, single antibody. It looks like a capital Y. It's actually made up of four protein chains. Two are short, and they call uh, those light chains. Two are long. Those are called heavy chains. You can see that these chains are held together by disulfide bonds, and which are covalent bonds with two sulfur atoms. They're pretty stable. Now, at the tops of the Ys, are the antigen binding sites. The bottom of the Y is the complement binding site. When we get to complement action, we'll, we'll see how why that's uh, relevant. And the vast majority of these chains are constant for our species. So if you look at that, that figure on the bottom right, it's the lighter purple is constant. It's in our genes. The amino acids are always the same. But in the dark purple, in the antigen binding site, that is where your plasma cells are putting different amino acids on there. Now, when you look at the single Y, that is a monomer. And you can see in the figure on the bottom left, IgG, IgE, and IgD are all single monomers. Then look at IgA that, that goes out in breast milk and tears and saliva. It's a dimer. It has two Ys that are back to back. Complement is not a part of IgA, so they don't, it doesn't matter that the two complement binding sites are occupied. 
And then you got the IGMs, which is a pentamer. You can see that it has five Ys. This is the antibodies of agglut agglutinins. So the agglutinins, which is anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D of blood typing, those are pentamers. And that's why they're able to bind to various different blood cells and agglutinate blood. All right, uh, slide four is a close-up from your textbook. Again, the variable region is what is different depending on the antigen that it wants to bind to. And the C are the constant areas, same amino acids in our species. So let's talk about those variable regions that bind to antigens. And this is slide five. On each chain, that area that binds to antigens is about 50 amino acids long. Since you have 50 on the heavy chain and 50 on the light chain, each antigen binding site, each upper arm of the Y is 100 amino acids. Since our proteins are made up of only 20 amino acids, you do the math. It's 100, it's 20 to the 100th power. That's how many possible combinations you can have in those 100 uh, amino acids. And that is why your immune system has, can cover all the antigens on this planet. Probably plus some. This is huge. And it's all about shapes, okay? So let's talk about this binding of these variable regions to antigens. This is sometimes what refer, is referred to as recognition. So when you have something that's foreign, it's gotta have also the absence of self markers which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And then on it has to be the presence of what we call epitopes. That is the actual binding site on the antigen that binds to the upper arms of the Y, epitopes. They can be, if they are uh, proteinaceous, they can be three to 10 amino acids long. They do not have to be made up of amino acids. It just has to be shaped like it. And so there's a bunch of things that are not protein or amino acids that have epitopes because they have the shape of things like this. And if they bind uh, to antibodies, it's gonna activate B cells. And this animation on the bottom left of this, this uh, slide six is showing you, it's all about lock and key. If the variable region on the antibodies of the B cells don't fit, it just bounces off. If it does fit, then they get activated. And we're gonna talk about basically what happens in detail once B cells are activated. Okay? So slide seven is from your textbook and it's showing you epitopes. Again, it doesn't have to be amino acids. It's just got shapes like it. All right, so now let's go to antibody actions. These are the various ways that antibodies can uh, deactivate things that don't belong in your body. Some of them can be viruses. Some of them can be chemicals. And uh, there's a handful of them. So first of all, let's go with neutralization. Neutralization is really about your antibodies going against chemicals like toxins. And when it binds to it, it does two things. It inactivates its toxicity. And when it is uh, changed chemically by this binding, the toxin becomes a toxoid. The second thing that that does is it puts a big red flag on it to get eaten by a macrophage. And then it's just broken down into parts into single links of whatever it is. Second is actually 
expanding on that uh, point about putting a big red flag for macrophages. That is actually called opsonization. And it is, it's just putting a big red flag on an antigen with, when it's covered with antibodies. And if you look at that bottom picture, you could see that the capital I's are binding to the epitopes at the top arms. And then the uh, complement proteins attach to that. And once it attaches to that, it's telling all the phagocytes in the area that this is something to eat and take out. So putting the big red flag on antigens to be eaten is opsonization. Three, precipitation. This is also for chemicals. Precipitation, for those of you who've taken chemistry, you should know this. This is where you have solutes that are soluble, liquid. When they precipitate, they become solid and they fall out of solution or settle out of solution. And it's usually a size thing. You know, you have, you know, these tiny little free floating uh, particles, solutes that they're so small, they're liquid form. And then as soon as you start binding all these Ys to it, it becomes huge and it becomes this solid grain that falls out of solution. Four is what we've talked about with blood typing. Four is agglutination. What you need to know is that it's not just non-compatible blood types that agglutinate. IgMs will agglutinate uh, bacteria as well. Okay, and you can see here that uh, in these pictures on the bottom right of this slide nine. That is agglutination of red blood cells. Okay. All right. Um, IgA's, because they're dimers, they can also agglutinate, but they're but that's not um, aggl agglutinins. The agglutinins, Ig, uh, anti A, anti B, and anti D, those are all IgM's pentamers. Okay, this is from your textbook showing some of those actions that we covered already. Only one more I want to go over. So we had four already, neutralization, opsonization, precipitation, agglutination, and five is lysis. And this is the killing of bacteria by complement proteins. Okay, now the complement proteins are nonspecific. Like they're just part of the many other plasma proteins. And remember I said we got albumin, globulin, fibrinogen, and many, many more. Well, there's 11 of these guys, and they're all listed under number four, many, many others. And uh, it all starts out with antibodies. And if you watch the animation, you can see it, the top arms of the... Y binds to epitopes, and then the complement binds to the bottom of the Y, and that triggers the whole cascade of reactions. We're finally ending with C5 to C9, punching physical holes in the cell membrane. And uh, this animation is only showing one. Well, it's going to be hundreds of holes, and if you punch hundreds of holes in a bacteria, it just falls apart. That's lysis, okay? Now, uh, for you, some of you have taken uh, microbiology yet. If you haven't, some bacteria have cell walls. Complement does nothing for cell walls. But that's where you need these other enzymes that will actually punch holes in the cell walls. And once you punch holes in the cell walls, which are outside the cell membrane, then complement can go in and start punching holes in in the uh, plasma membrane, which is inside the cell wall. Okay, slide 12 is just showing you pictures of the slices, but it's a whole cascade of reactions. All right, so that's uh, 
covering the five actions of antibodies. Now let's go through the five types. Five types. Five, five. Five is a good subject for matching. All right, so we saw this picture already. Three of them are monomers. IgA is a dimer. IgM is a pentamer. IgG is the most common, and this is basically the immunoglobulins that are part of the globulins of plasma proteins. Okay? It's also found in tissue, fluids, and it attacks just about everything. Uh, one of the things that's relevant for the coronavirus is those that have shown to be, especially if they are well now, and, and this is the, some of the testing they're trying to get developed. There's um, some tests, the old swabs in the nasal pharynx is actually trying to find viruses. But now what we need to do, especially if we want to open up, start to open up gradually the economy. Okay, and I'm just gonna just say this right now, and I, I don't care if it's recorded. People last week that are out protesting shelter in place, are complete and total idiots. And this is what happens when the processes, the normal processes we have of discerning and perceiving reality are deconstructed. This is the real danger when an American president calls part of the media, the press is actually mentioned in the First Amendment, fake news. It's not even about the politics or ideology. You have deconstructed how we're supposed to learn about the rest of the country and what is real, what's deconstructed. Now everybody can make up their own reality. And we have a bunch of people who are saying, go ahead and give me coronavirus. Well, that's great. There's still a lot of young to middle-aged adults that die from it. But if you survive it, and you're not social distancing, you're giving it to a lot of people who will. The Constitution does not guarantee you the right to be so stupid as to endanger yourself and others, period. But that's what happens when we don't have any set ways of perceiving reality. This is why we need science, because science is a way of perceiving reality independent of your ideology. But these people that are protesting is flat out against empirical science. And we have an actual president who is encouraging it. And I want you just to think about that. All right, so some of the tests that we need to uh, develop for coronavirus is not just do you have antibodies, but what type of antibodies? And that's why this slide is relevant. IgG, tends to be higher in people who are recovered from it and now have immunity to it, okay? Those are the people, and again, it's shades of gray. At this point, we are thinking, if you have higher levels of specific IgG for coronavirus, you can actually go out and be in the real world because you can't even carry the virus on you unless it's on your clothes or on your skin. So you still got to wash your hands all the time. You might not get it inside you. You might not be able to sneeze it on anybody. You can still have it on your skin. All right. IgA, again, we covered that. It's uh, found in exocrine secretions, spit, tears, breast milk, stomach acid, and uh, also, also the mucus in respiratory tracts. <clears throat> Because it is a dimer, it could do uh, agglutination. So a lot of the highlighted words on these five bullets are going to be from the actions that we just covered. So it can do precipitation or agglutination. IgM, again, is the pentamer. Five Ys in it. It does a lot of agglutination. And then when you agglutinate something, us together, it's a little bit bigger than just obstinization, flagging it to be eaten. It's bigger and this actually will trigger inflammation. And by the way, if someone has just caught 
coronavirus, they will have more IgMs for coronavirus. And you gotta you gotta still be quarantined because you still have you can be asymptomatic, and apparently some people can go through this whole thing without any symptoms, which is from an epidemiological perspective, scary as hell. But uh, there are some people that can have very mild symptoms or just be getting into serious COVID-19 and they'll have uh, IgMs. Well, you, you gotta stay quarantined until you run this course, go two weeks, probably two weeks in a few days, and then we can check your uh, blood again and hopefully you'll have more IgGs by then. And then it's like, yeah, you're immune. You can go out and about. Uh, hopefully this is helpful trying to tie what's actually happening right now with some of this uh, immunology. IgEs are basically covered on mast cells, tissue mast cells. So this is the antibody of allergic reactions. Once a... Um, Allergen, an allergen is a specific antigen that binds to IgEs. And once an allergen binds to the top part, top arms of the IgEY, it's going to cause the uh, mast cell to release histamine. IgDs are the ones on um, B lymphocytes. And so the thought is that this is about initiating. Uh, the activation of this antibody mediated immune response. So there are the five classes of antibodies. Three are monomers, one dimer, one pentamer. Next slide 15. Bring your textbook is showing you those five. And you can see that there is another protein that links the complement binding in or base of the Y for those uh, IGAs and IGMs. All right, now let's talk about the production of antibodies. And this topic again, uh, and I said this before, is uh, I'm, re I'm gonna re be repeating various things because we're talking about it from slightly different perspectives. We've already mentioned in the basics how your immune system works better if you've had a previous exposure. Why? Because of this. Then we talked about immune memory, about how the primary immune response is slow and wimpy, and the secondary immune response is rapid and huge. It's because of this. Everybody get it? So this is explaining immune memory. Okay, so our immune systems can learn. They, can, they have the ability to be instructive. And that is because of um, maintaining memory B cells and prime T cells. That is what generates the secondary immune response. It does it by this, the clonal selection theory. This is our best explanation of this so far. <clears throat> and this is also showing you the shades of gray of even things that are inherited and things that are acquired. The ability to become immune to coronavirus is going to be acquired, but we have to have something in our bodies beforehand that we inherited. This is uh, also the shades of gray between specific immunity and nonspecific resistance. This is basically what I'm we're talking about here with this diamond of getting an inherited lymphocyte part of our species resistance, the very first nonspecific resistance we talked about. Our ancestors gave us the, these lymphocytes for the bugs of this planet. And human beings do have uh, lymphocytes for SARS viruses. And coronavirus is one of the SARS viruses. All right, so you, you, are, you inherit that from your ancestors. That gives you some of your species resistance. And each lymphocyte that you inherit has the ability to recognize uh, an antigen. An individual lymphocyte can only recognize one, okay? And you are given this without ever being exposed to this. 
And so I'm going to use an example of smallpox, and you can change smallpox to corona, just call it coronavirus. You are <clears throat> given a B lymphocyte that can only produce one antibody uh, for one particular antigen. And this would be SARS-CoV-2. Again, this uh, a antibody, I mean, excuse me, this lymphocyte is inherited. Is it possible for a future virus for which no human being has this inherited B lymphocyte? Yes, which is why our politicians need to be smart enough to know what they don't know and listen to the people who do know. Because more than likely, they don't know, but they have the best educated guess. And in this case, it is actually possible. And this is one of the real dangers of overpopulation. If a bug like this comes out when we have no room to have distancing because what, there's 8 million people, I mean, at some point, that's one of the things that flattens out our overpopulation is there could be a bug for which no human has this inherited cell and it's just going to wipe out the planet and only certain areas that were able to be separated from it will have human beings that survive. You just got to just think about this and then look at those protests of people protesting shelter in place. All right. <clears throat> so this uh, B cell can differentiate to make IgD antibodies for, and I'm going to replace smallpox with coronavirus. So if we can develop of that vaccine, there's going to be attenuated viruses. Attenuated means altered. Or maybe they can find another SARS virus that is close enough to, sh to give you cross immunity. Either one is called an attenuated virus. <laughs> Once you get the vaccine, it's going to, the epitopes of that vaccine are going to bind to the B cells with the IgDs on them, and it's going to be turned on. That's going to trigger, and this is a second diamond on slide 17, it's going to trigger a lot of IP mats. It's going to do a lot of cell cycles, but all of the resulting daughter cells are all identical. They're all B cell clones. Some are going to become plasma cells and make antibodies for the coronavirus. Now you're going to be immune to the coronavirus. When that day happens, then we can open up our economies. Until that happens, opening it up before then is only going to spread things out further. It's only going to make the economy worse because we, now you think you can go back? You're not going to go back to the end of 2020 when we might have been able to go back partially in the summer. You go back too soon? No, nah, we can't open up in the summer. Now we're going to shoot for the fall. Then there will be other people that are going to be not believing science. We're going to go into 2021. What do you think the economy is going to be if everybody is still having the shelter in place for over a year? Just connect the dots. Okay. Some of these B cells are going to become memory cells. And they stick around for a while, hopefully for the rest of your life. So after the vaccine is gone, after you're well, you have these memory cells so that if this guy comes back again and doesn't mutate, then you're going to be able to be fine. Fight it off with a huge, fast, secondary immune response. You don't even know that you were exposed to it again. Again, the jury is still out about if this guy mutates and maybe it mutates every year. We don't know that yet, but hopefully not. And then your immunity is lifelong, like it was to smallpox. Okay. Now, there are various viral 
bugs and pandemics that has caused great suffering on this planet. And you could already start to see the deconstruction of how we view objective reality, that we have anti-vaxxers. Measles should already be gone from this planet. And this is what you got to understand. Viruses are not living. They are only biochemicals. And biochemicals that cannot live separate or cannot be active separate of cells. Most, the vast majority of viruses, if they're exposed to the outside world, they just fall apart. Um, some viruses can actually be in uh, frozen in glaciers or in the ice caps, and they can actually still be viable, which is one thing to be concerned about climate change, which the president also doesn't believe. But as the polar ice caps melt, there can be viruses that haven't been on this planet infecting humans for tens of thousands of years, all of a sudden, poof, we're going to get them out. Okay. <clears throat> Again, so this is the shades of gray. It's not either or. It's both and. With the clonal selection theory, the original B cell was inherited. Part of species resistance. But all the clones were acquired by the clonal selection theory, okay? All right, then let's go to histocompatibility because this uh, leads us into immune disorders. Histocompatibility comes from various self markers that are proteins put on the plasma membranes of basically all your cells. Again, it's all shades of gray. This, uh, the gene for the self markers referred to as MHC, or major histocompatibility complexes, is on chromosome number six. So remember protein synthesis, uh, gene or the DNA code, uh, codon, anticodon, you got MHCs the proteins. <clears throat> now all your cells have them, but in the case of this getting a, sp a specific immune response, say some pathogen gets past non-specific resistance and now it's involving your immune system, specific immunity. Basically what it is is a macrophage somewhere eats this bug, rips it apart and puts parts of them on top of the MHC complex for that macrophage. So it just puts it right on top. This is called antigen presentation. And this is what triggers both wings of specific immunity. Okay? And that's what it's saying on the second bullet. And you can see pictures of it. So uh, on the picture on the bottom left, there's a macrophage with bare naked MHC complexes. It eats this uh, bug, breaks it apart, and it puts parts of it on top of the MHC complex. When it puts parts of another thing on top of MHC, it suddenly is no longer self. Only the bare MHC is self. Okay? And it could trigger both wings. And on the bottom right, underneath is the uh, antibody-mediated wing, and then on top of that is the cell-mediated wing. From your textbook on the following slide, that's slide 19, is showing you MHC complex of the macrophage, the cell on top, and the helper T cell binding to the MHC complex of the macrophage that has the part of the antigen on top. That uh, site, the receptor site, is called the CD4 receptor site. Keep that in mind. In fact, circle CD4 of that helper T cell. 
because actually the macrophage also has CD4 receptors. All right, so some immune diseases. We have autoimmune diseases, and this is the failure of your immune system to discern that your cells are self. Okay. We actually mentioned this in type 1 diabetes mellitus in lab 8. It was in the PowerPoint. The most common form of type 1 diabetes mellitus is caused by an autoimmune destruction of beta cells. The beta cells, MHC complexes, are deficient. Your immune system decides your beta cells are foreign and takes them out. Multiple sclerosis, I made a joke about this when we were doing the wave around the room. Uh, that's because it is an autoimmune destruction of the myelin sheet. So especially when we we're doing the wave with the myelin, myelinated, that gets all screwed up with MS. Uh, and the reason why I became, became a teacher was because I came down with rheumatoid arthritis. I got a, a bug in the Central American jungles. My immune system fought it off before I even got back home. Five years later, it decided, I did well. The IgM, IgG complexes on the synovial membranes are too similar to that bug. And it decided to start attacking my own synovial genes. That's when I had to get out of dentistry. Immune complex disease. And this is slide 21. This is uh, not um, just the antigen. It's not just the antibodies. It's a combination. It is when they bind antigen to antibodies together that we start to see some problems. So uh, in the case of certain bacteria, viruses, and parasites, <clears throat> once antibodies start to attack them, it actually will start to cause inflammation of of the arteries, periarteritis nodosa. Same thing uh, happens with uh, hepatitis B. And then we have uh, self antigens and autoantibodies again. And so some of these will be on both slides. So you can have an autoimmune creation of antibodies. And then once they bind the antigens, then you got an immune complex disease. And so rheumatoid arthritis is that, uh, lupus is that. Lupus is a little bit more wide range in organ systems because it is IgG DNA chromatin. And since there's chromatin uh, with DNA in all your cells, it can affect uh, the heart and the lungs and even joints. There's an arthritic element to lupus. And then allergies, there are a couple different main uh, classifications. They're all called hypersensitivity because it is a hyper response of the immune system when it's not really needed. And it's actually the hyper response that is the problem. Again, these antigens are called allergens. The first main type is immediate hypersensitivity. Uh, this is like hay fever, which I'm having right now, which is funny because, you know, all the grasses are blooming and I'm allergic to it. So I'm, I got the sniffles. And if I have to have, ever have to go to the store, you know, and I have to blow my nose or, you know, causes me to sneeze. Everyone's already going, got coronavirus. You know, okay, whatever. Um, this is again, allergens binding to IgEs on mast cells. They release a lot of histamines, and then you get the inflammation that comes with it. It's just that this inflammation is not necessary. And when you get inflammation when it's not necessary, it's the inflammation that's the problem. And then you got a series of pictures on the bottom showing you the mast cell releasing histamines. And boom, there you have it. And it's usually pretty immediate. I mean, it's just one step. Allergen binds to the upper arms of IgEs, boom, you got histamines, boom, you got a runny nose or whatever, okay? <clears throat> now, hopefully your immediate hypersensitivities will be local and limited. 
like in your nose or, you know, uh, if you get other sorts of uh, allergens, food allergies, hopefully it's just right there. Um, when it becomes systemic, and you should eventually learn these words, localized is just in that tiny area, systemic is whole body. When uh, this histamine reaction becomes whole body, we call that anaphylaxis. And there's two things that uh, make anaphylaxis deadly. One is you have too many uh, blood vessels vasodilating. And if you got, and we just talked about flow and things for lecture exam three, so this should be relevant. If you take too many blood vessels and open it, your blood pressure drops. Uh, also, the blood flow slows up way too much. Uh, the second thing is, is that one of the signs of inflammation is swelling because once your vessels all open up, things leak between the endothelial cells. And the second way <clears throat> that anaphylaxis kills you is uh, it causes tissues to swell, especially around your airways, and you can actually suffocate. All right, I figured uh, from your textbook on slide 23 showing you the same thing. Allergen there showing you pollen, binding to IgE, resulting in the release of histamine. The second uh, main classification of hypersensitivity is delayed hypersensitivity. And please um, put the word delayed in quotation marks, delayed. It is definitely slower. <clears throat> than immediate hypersensitivity. And most oftentimes, um, because you're doing this through the cell-mediated wing to activate cytotoxic T cells takes longer. Um, it's usually one to three days. So a good uh, example of this is contact dermatitis like poison oak. TB, uh, TB skin test, and this is why when you have to do a TB skin test for a job, why well, you got to go back 48 hours later and have it read because it's in the one to three day range. Okay. But, but here's the thing, and this is why you want to put delay in quotation marks. If you've been exposed, say, you know, uh, nowadays the what they make uh, gloves and other medical rubber out of is really hypo hypoallergenic. But back then with the original latex gloves, there were people that had delayed hypersensitivity to latex gloves. And <clears throat> for a while, there was no other choice. And if they had repeated procedures where the healthcare provider had to wear latex gloves, they start to build up prime T cells for latex. And if you build up enough prime T cells for latex or poison oak or for whatever, that thing can actually start come rising up. That reaction can start rising up in minutes. Again, it's not as fast as uh, immediate hypersensitivity, but when it says one to three days, it could be less than one to three hours if somebody has a lot of prime T cells. It could be less than 10 to 30 minutes if a guy has plenty of prime T cells. So in quotation marks, okay? All right, last topic for lecture exam three as it relates to immunology is, is HIV and AIDS. And I'm, I'm gonna use this to teach you minimal virology, which is really what we, the American public needs to learn right now so that they don't do stupid things like protest shelter in place. <clears throat> and also this uh, virus, it targets the immune system. And so that's why this is uh, doubly relevant and why I'm gonna spend some time on it before we close out lecture exam three. The uh, HIV is what we call an RNA retrovirus. And let me move this over. All right. 
So when we were in lecture exam one and talking about protein synthesis, I'm not going to do it all. All right, does that look somewhat similar to what you remember in lecture exam one when we talked about protein synthesis? Well, RNA, um, HIV is an RNA retrovirus. Now, a virus minimally has a nucleic acid and a protein capsule. We call it capsid. So, minimally, nucleic acid, protein capsid. There can be other things on it, and coronavirus and HIV have other things on it, but all viruses are minimally those two biologically important macromolecules. Now the nucleic acid for some is DNA, but for the nucleic acid for HIV, it's RNA. And the reason why it's called RNA is we gotta look at the rest of its infective cycle. It has uh, an addition to, in addition to the uh, capsid, these glycoprotein binding sites called GP120s. And so the GP120s are is what is attracted to and binds to CD4 receptors. We mentioned this earlier, I'm gonna repeat it again. <clears throat> now what, the reason why this is called a retrovirus is that HIV has RNA. And protein synthesis is supposed to go in this direction, transcription and eventually translation. The reason why this is called a retrovirus is because once it gets into the cell, it has an enzyme and it's called reverse transcriptase. That's up on top of the slide. that actually puts foreign DNA yeah, that's not the DNA you got from your parents. But it puts a sequence in somewhere in your chromosomes of HIV's DNA. It didn't come from the virus. The virus put this in you. Because of this enzyme, it used your DNA nucleotides to put in something foreign in one of your chromosomes. And that's called the DNA provirus. And now, once that's in your genome, and that's step number four here in this figure, these are all these diamonds on the bottom of the slide. Now you can use your enzymes
to make not your proteins, but HIV proteins. That includes a new capsid. Well, once you get to this point, you get back to HIV RNA. This has just got to go into the new capsids. Boom. That cell has become a virus-making factory, making thousands of HIVs that can infect other cells. Okay? And this cell that's going to make thousands of HIVs just puts apart. That's also called lysis. Just falls apart. So there's a little animation showing you the virus, how it enters the cell. Okay. <clears throat> Now let's go back to that slide on uh, histocompatibility. The picture from your textbook that shows the helper T cell has a CD4 receptor. Actually, macrophages also have CD4 receptors. And that's what this first diamond is saying. And those are the cells that HIV is targeting. Now that means if you go back to the figure, last week's PowerPoint, the last figure that shows everything, and I told you to look at that table on essay number five and see if you can't see all of that in that figure. The only two cells that are in both wings is the macrophage, because it initiates both wings and the helper T cells because it stimulates both wings. And that is how HIV decimates an immune system. And this is what you got to get about HIV. Now, HIV has had so many advances that it's almost like, you know, people don't even care about it anymore. I got, I got HIV and I just got to take these drugs for the rest of my life. Well, hopefully you always have good medical insurance. <clears throat> but these antiviral drugs have really kept this thing way down. And, and uh, I, uh, there's a little, few more pages in the lecture packet on HIV and AIDS. And one of the things I have to keep renewing is new CDC numbers on AIDS. And the, and the numbers are gradually going down. When I first started teaching here, they were going up. And now I'm noticing that it's starting to go down. And it's because of all these uh, antiviral drugs. You can I even see some of these antiviral drugs uh, advertised on TV. But what you have to understand is that without these drugs, and there's still a lot of places on the planet where people just die of AIDS, um, nobody actually dies of HIV. They die from a decimated immune system because it hits both macrophages and helper T cells. It decimates both wings. And you get people dying from strange bugs. And since uh, the cell mediated wing is the thing that holds down cancers, you get strange cancers that uh, kill in uh, AIDS. Again, um, HIV is not highly infectious. It has a difficult time getting past nonspecific resistance. You have to catch it. You gotta catch enough of it to actually become HIV positive. Uh, it's not in all secretions. When I first started practicing dentistry, that was right when this thing came out. And uh, the whole field of dentistry was scared shitless. And it turns out that we really didn't need to be because IgAs and other things in saliva makes it not communicable through the mouth and oral secretions. Um, but it was good because it made all dentists actually do uh, more sterile technique. And uh, we should have been doing that anyway for other things, but just not HIV. <clears throat> but it is in blood and semen and vaginal secretion. So it is oftentimes communicated to other people and spread through sexual contact, as well as uh, vertical transmissions that smother the child. Those have gone down quite a bit and uh, also infected uh, needles, contaminated needles 
from uh, drug abusers. So that's uh, that is basically the way you can get it. You know, you don't get it from toilets. You don't get it from doorknobs. Um, and hopefully we can find some of this out about coronavirus too. But HIV basically, as soon as it dries out, falls apart and is not infectious. All right, so there's been various uh, HIV detections. Um, a big problem in the past is that uh, testing for antibodies just took way too long. And the same kind of uh, problem can happen here with coronavirus, and that's why they're trying to be more sophisticated with, well, what kind of antibodies does this person have, IgM or IgG? Um, and then on, on the bottom of this slide is talking about not testing for antibodies, but rather testing for um, antigens. And this is uh, somewhat similar to some of the swab tests of the nasal pharynx for coronavirus. They're, they're not tests for antibodies, they're tests to see if you got the virus. All right, uh, let's talk about HIV treatment. And this is basically what has even been expanded upon since then. Um, most of that first slide where we talked about the reproductive cycles of what HIV does once it infects cells, uh, because that became known, scientists have been able to develop heart, which is a, a multiple drug cocktail that inhibits HIV in every one of those steps that you see on that figure. Um, there have been now several cases of uh, people when, and a few decades ago, it was thought to be a death sentence. And now it's just like, well, you just gotta keep it down. And this is actually the way of treatment of a lot of um, things we used to consider deadly, including some cancers is you just hold it down and you hold it down and you hold it down for years and pretty soon you hold it down for decades and pretty soon the person dies of old age or something else. And so even though you didn't technically get a cure, you practically got a cure because the person lived a long life and died of something else. Okay. So that's pretty much what's going on with HIV. Uh, Magic Johnson was one of the first cases <laughs> Again, uh, they cannot detect HIV in Magic Johnson. Uh, no one would consider him cured. There is only one thing that can cure a person of virus, and that's the immune system. And because HIV attacks the immune system, when you have HIV, even though you can be successfully managed, they would not consider you cured. Now, if we can get a, um, a vaccine for coronavirus, we can actually start causing a worldwide cure. And here's the reality. We should already have a worldwide cure of measles. It should be non-existent on our planet, except for ignorant anti-vaxxers. And I wonder when the anti-vaxxers are gonna talk about, you know, why do we, I don't wanna have this corona vaccine. I mean, just, just this is what happens when you deconstruct how people perceive objective reality. Okay. Um, there was a case, uh, I did add this slide a year ago. There was a case uh, of someone who has gotten some stem cells from a bone marrow transplant for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the uh, stem cells had, had a mutation, a CCR5 mutation. And at the present time, um, they can't find HIV in this person. So there is that possible treatment as well. And that would be considered uh, quote unquote cure. Again, um, what you need to know is that HIV and AIDS are not equivalent terms. HIV is the causal virus. Um, AIDS is the name of the syndrome acquired immune deficiency syndrome. There are four classically uh, recognized stages, and it's basically as the uh, viral load goes up, the helper T cell counts go down. So at some point, you just 
you just don't have an immune system anymore. And again, uh, the last point on slide 30 is that there are some areas, and the United States is actually, we're seeing numbers go down, but there are some areas where a good number of people still die from AIDS. Like you need another virus to worry about. Okay, well, slide 31 is just a transition, and I'll start on slide 32 on Wednesday. Since I got some time, let me talk about lecture exam three. Um, it's going to have about 30 multiple choice questions, about 20 matching questions, plus some, because again, I've taken the essays and I've converted them to uh, object, objective questions, either uh, multiple choice, matching, or, uh, you know, fill in the blank, short answers. Um, I would still study the essays as if you were writing out an essay because to answer these objective questions, you do need to know this material backwards and forwards, okay? Lecture exam three started with uh, hormones and the endocrine system. You need to know the four chemical classes of hormones. Uh, you need to know well, the basic definition of hormones and where they come from, difference between endocrine and exocrine. Um, you need to know about how steroids and thyroxin can actually enter the cell, first messenger, whereas um, polypeptide and protein hormones need a second messenger. You need to know what that second messenger is, that whole mechanism, the whole amplification as well, cascade. Then we get into uh, the muscle physiology. Most of it is skeletal muscle. Last three essays on your handout is from skeletal muscle sliding filament theory. Uh, you need to know about uh, ATP sources. You need to know about uh, response to exercise. You need to know the uh, distinction between isotonic and isometric contractions. You got to know about length, tension, relationships with skeletal muscles and how it, re and how it contrasts with smooth and cardiac muscle. You need to know the three types of skeletal muscle fibers based on the, eight, the myosin ATPase isoenzymes. <clears throat> you need to know the distinction between multi-unit and single-unit smooth muscle. The characteristics and differences of cardiac muscle. Oh, there's going to be a question on inotropic and chronotropic. Cardiac muscle action potentials, why it looks like a slanted box in which ions are moving. Frank Starling, Law of the Heart, there's going to be a question. Elastic arteries, muscular arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, medium veins, large veins. Uh, the distinction of what is happening across the capillary bed from the arterial end to the venial end. Yeah, and do all, do all the essays because I can ask it either as an essay or as multiple choice questions well. And now the ones that I would be asking as essay questions have been converted to objective questions as well. You need to know... more stuff there. On the immune system, you do need to know the, uh, um, basically the summary and the, uh, everything that I've given you highlighted, underlined, or bolded, non-specific resistance, specific immunity, cell, medi cell mediated versus antibody mediated, which cells are involved, what's the final outcome, Questions on types of immunity. Uh, histocompatibility, 
immune disorders, there's going to be a couple of questions, and there'll be at least one question on HIV. Okay. I think that this about does it. I got it done in time. So um, maybe print up a copy of the uh, lecture exam four study guide, and we'll go over that, start a Wednesday lecture, and then start on lecture exam four material. We'll have two lectures on lecture exam four, and then... Uh, and then we'll have lecture exam three a week from Wednesday. Okay? Whew, got it done. No questions? Um, so lecture exam three is on Wednesday, you said? A week from Wednesday. Just add seven days to whatever these announcements say. Like this slide right here, slide 31, says Wednesday, April 22nd. Add seven days. Okay, so... On um, Wednesday, uh, April 29th. Okay, gotcha. And then um, our lab, is it right after our lab test? Yeah, oh, that, that's one thing that we should talk about. Wednesday lab. Wednesday lab, email me. You have to take the lab quiz sometime either on Monday or Wednesday. Now, uh, it's... Gonna, and I got to do it all together on Canvas. I can't have some do it on Monday and some do it on Wednesday. But I'm going to need, by the end of the week, your vote on whether or not you want to do it on Monday, the lab quiz next week on Monday, or do the lab quiz maybe a, a couple hours later on Wednesday. And so that's your two choices. You either do it on Monday with Monday Lab, or you do the lab quiz next week. Um, let's see, it was 2.15. You could start at 4.15. Okay, and then can we take pictures of the board, please? What's that? Can we take pictures of the board? Oh, right now? Yes. Yeah, I'll do that right now. But a Wednesday lab, please send me an email on your vote to either take the lab quiz on Monday or the lab quiz later on Wednesday at 4.15. And whatever one gets the most point, uh, votes, that's the way we're going to go. I'll put a Canvas announcement, and that's when you're going to have to take the lab quiz next week. Okay? Thank you. All right. Here's the left bank, and it's a summary of the topic of immunology. Okay. And here's the middle bank, just showing you the normal protein synthesis and then uh, HIV's retrovirus, reverse transcri transcriptase going in the opposite direction. That's why it's called the retrovirus. All right. Thank you. How, how do you want us to vote on taking the lab? Just send me an email and just tell me which oh. way you want to go. Okay. 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 All right. And I'll, and I'll send an announcement on Canvas on Friday telling you when the lab quiz is going to be next week for Wednesday lab. Oh, man. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All righty.